in Uganda. We have 46 chimpanzees that have all been rescued from the illegal wildlife trade. This is Tumbo right here. Tumbo looks like an older male. He's just prematurely gray. He's about 25 years of age, which is a prime age for a chimpanzee. And then this is Sarah and Minnie to the right. Sarah and Minnie were rescued together from an illegal wildlife trader in the South Sudan and brought to the sanctuary when they were very young. And Tumbo was rescued from the airport. Okay, for some reason it's not. We're going to visit the wildlife of Ethiopia, Uganda, and Rwanda. Has anyone been to these countries? Fantastic. Where have you been? Oh, you've been to two of my favorite places. Right. Oh, that's great. I would love to talk to you more about your work. This is one of the elephants that I photographed in Uganda, right, in Murchison Falls National Park. I'm also the CEO of Chris Austria Productions, LLC, and our mission is to empower communities and conserve wildlife through photography, film, and music. These are the children of the Simeon Mountains in Ethiopia, and to the right, you see one of my favorite animals, the giraffe. I'm very honored to have a guest here of mine, Suzanne York. She is a consultant on my wildlife conservation documentary. She's from Transition Earth, and Suzanne, if you would be kind enough to tell us about your organization. Sure. Yeah, thank you. Great to be here. Can everybody hear me all right? Oh, thanks, Tina. Um, as Chris said, I run a project called Transition Earth. It's a project of Earth Island Institute in Berkeley, and we look at the impacts of population growth and unsustainable resource use on people and the planet and ways that we can actually empower people to protect the planet as well as their communities and their own families. So a lot of this involves empowering women, uh, young girls, just youth education in general, and then looking at how much we consume and really how the whole global economic system is set up. Um, but one of my favorite ways of talking about these issues is a little bit of what Chris is gonna talk about today, it's linking issues like conservation and health and livelihoods. There's a development approach called PHE or Population Health and Environment where it's linking these different sectors so people are actually able to deal with family planning, maternal health, child mortality, as well as natural resource management, livelihoods, economic empowerment. So it's kind of linking everything in a, in a way that empowers, again, people and the local environment. And I find that it's a, a wonderful way to engage with people, telling these stories of what's happening on the ground in Uganda or Borneo or Nepal. There's actually a lot of successful projects happening. So Chris is going to talk more about this today, but if you're interested, you can visit my website. I have some information over here on the table, and I, you know, I'm a big cheerleader for the linked approach of, of bringing together all these multiple issues so we can really find a successful way to, to save our communities and our environment. Thank you. Also, Suzanne, oh, yeah. Kanari Webb, Dr. Kanari Webb is supposed to join us, but she's not here yet, and she is the founder of Health and Harmony, and their organization is in Borneo. And since she's not here yet, can you introduce her work since you have been to Borneo and have seen the orangutans? Sure. Well, Health and Harmony is based in Portland, Oregon, and they work specifically with a health clinic in Borneo that's doing what I was just mentioning. They're linking healthcare and conservation. Um, Dr. Webb founded the organization, I think, about eight years ago with a couple of other, other Indonesians. And they found that people were logging the forest in this community that they worked in illegally because they couldn't afford health care. And so they felt they had no other alternative. So they would log the forest, and that was threatening the orangutans and other pressures. And of course, there's palm oil development going on there as well. But people were doing it just to survive and take care of their families. And so what Health and Harmony and the clinic is called ATRI, which stands for Alam Sahat Lestari in Bahasa Indonesian, and it means health and nature everlasting. And so they founded the clinic, and they told people they could pay for health care in any way they could afford, providing seedlings, volunteering their time, even if they couldn't pay at all. They just wanted people to kind of get health care and to stop logging. And it's actually been working. They've been in the community for a long time now, and people are coming to the health clinic. They've just expanded to a bigger hospital. So people are using it. They're, they're paying in whatever ways possible, but they're also learning a lot about conservation. They have a Conservation for Kids program. That's educating youth. They, they live right near a, a national park where they have orangutans. Um, the little 
postcard I have over here has an orangutan on it that I saw in the wild. So it's a very special community. And again, they're just they're bringing health care, they're bringing livelihoods, organic farming, jobs, and education to these kids. So it's Health and Harmony, and the clinic is called Ostri. Thank you, Suzanne. You can drop the mic. Mic dropping moment. We're going to talk about conservation because, unfortunately, we have lost about 58% of animal populations just within the last 40 years. Of course, tigers are highly endangered. This is um, a little frog that I found in, in Yungwe Forest in Rwanda. About a third of the world's amphibians are on the brink of extinction, and frogs are an indicator species. They're able to really determine and reflect health of the environment or the problems that are in the environment because they're very sensitive. Africa is the second largest continent. There are 54 countries and 11 million square miles. We're going to be right here in the Horn of Africa, Ethiopia, and then where I live, Uganda and Rwanda, is just to the south. I'd like to show this map because not all of us realize how big this continent really is. You can see that China, India, US, Eastern Europe and Germany, Spain and all these other countries fit within the continent of Africa. I'd like to show pictures of buildings and roads because many people think that Africa is just desert, jungle, savanna. Africa has beautiful structures. Hello, Kenari. We were just talking about you. Here's Dr. Kanari Webb. You heard all about her work from Suzanne. Thank you very much for coming. Great Kentucky Fried Chicken here at Acacia Mall in Kampala. But there, there are roads, there are buildings, there's big cities in countries in Africa. Dr. Jane Goodall was a role model of mine for many years, ever since I was a child. My parents were nature lovers. They had a lot of National Geographics around the house. And I read about the work of Jane Goodall in Gombe, Tanzania, with the chimpanzees. And that really inspired me. I knew that I wanted to work in conservation. Are you guys familiar with George and Joy Adamson? There's a movie, Born Free. They took care of lions and rehabilitated them. I knew from a very young age that my greatest dream truly was to work with the big cats. And that dream finally did come true. I worked at Six Flags in Vallejo for many years, Oregon Tig Tiger Sanctuary, as well as the San Francisco Zoo. This is Rakan. This is a male Bengal tiger. He's about 450 pounds. It took me about two years to get to know him before he had my trust. And then the lion on the right is Nika. This is the first lion that I raised. As you can see, the numbers of tigers has dropped dramatically. This was a life-changing experience for me. I learned so much. It inspired deep within me a desire to protect endangered species. And most importantly, <coughs> I learned working with the big cats. Even though they're top apex predators, they have feelings emotion, they share bonds, which are very similar to ours. They each have distinct personalities. Seeing my first lion, female lion, in Uganda was really remarkable because it really remind, reminded me of Nika, who I helped to raise. I moved to Ethiopia about four and a half years ago where I met Suzanne. I was working for an organization called Wildlife for Sustainable Development. We were working on elephant conservation in eastern Ethiopia. This is really a remarkable country. It's the source of the Blue Nile. The Blue Nile, Lake Tana is right here in Bahadat. The Blue Nile travels all the way up to Sudan. There's also the Albertine White Nile from Uganda that travels all the way up. It meets the Blue Nile in Khartoum, and then it travels all the way to Egypt and spills out to, into the Mediterranean. The Nile is the longest river in the world. It's approximately 4,258 miles long. Have you guys heard of Australopithecus afarensis or Lucy? Lucy is our earliest hominid relative. She was bipedal. She walked on two legs. She is really at the root of our human family tree. Lucy was found right here in the lower Awash Valley. Ethiopia is truly the um, cradle of humanity. Oma 1 and 2 Homo sapiens, their skeletal remains were found in the lower area right here. And that was about 200,000 years ago. We all originated from this remarkable country. There are nine UNESCO World Heritage Sites. This is one of them. This is the Zagwai Dynasty in Lalibela. And during the 12th century, they carved 11 monolithic churches literally from the living rock. This goes down about 85 feet, and you can go inside. It, it seems almost impossible that they were able to create these really beautiful churches. This is the Great Rift Valley. It's a fracture in the Earth's surface caused by the shifting of the tectonic plates. 
that occurred 30 million years ago. This is where the remains of Australopithecus afarensis was found. The Great Rift Valley starts in the um, area of the Baca Valley in Lebanon, which produces great wine, by the way, in the Baca Valley. I'm also a wine lover. It travels all the way south to central Mozambique. It's about 4,000 miles long. It can be seen from space. The Great Rift Valley caused beautiful escarpments and arid climate. It was perfect for the proliferation of life. This is the Eastern Rift Valley. There's also the Western Rift Valley, which runs through Uganda. So volcanic activity in Eastern Ethiopia has caused beautiful lakes and hot springs. It's so relaxing here. It's about 95 degrees, just like a, 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 sauna, a sauna or a spa. And there are also lions here in this area. This is Mount Sentali. It's a dormant volcano. Elevation, you can see, is very high. And the um, crater is about two and a half miles wide. Do you guys like hyenas? I am fascinated by hyenas. They are a female-dominated society. Interesting fun fact, female hyenas have genitalia that is very similar to that of a male. I won't go into detail, but you guys can Google that. Hyenas, uh, during the third trimester of pregnancy, female hyenas have a very high level of androgen, which is a steroid hormone. Testosterone is, is an androgen. And they pass on the androgen to their young pups through the umbilical cord, and that's why they're rearing, ready to go. Hyenas are very aggressive right out the gate as soon as they're born, but there's a lot of them in Ethiopia. They look dog-like, but they're closely related to the civet and the mongoose. There's also the Simeon Mountains. Here's some video that I took. The Simeon is also a UNESCO World Heritage Site. These are the Chalada Mountain Monkeys. They are endemic to Ethiopia. They are only found in the northern part of the country, specifically Ethiopia. These primates make about 32 different sounds and vocalizations, which is more than any other non-human primate. You can see one of the babies right underneath. Literally, I didn't have to zoom in with my camera. I was about this close. And as long as you don't reach out and touch them, get them they pretty much ignore you. And the music that you're going to hear today is from my friend DJ Colette, Now we're going to go where I live, which is Rwanda, the land of a thousand hills. This is the capital, Kigali. Have any of you guys seen Gorillas in the Mist, Diane Fossey? Her work was right here in Volcanoes National Park. The mountain gorillas are found in the Virunga Massif. If you've guys seen the movie Virunga, it's, it's really phenomenal. But it's a chain of eight volcanoes. It spans the Democratic Republic of the Congo as well as Volcanoes National Park and Imga Hindi National Park in Uganda. Everywhere you look, Rwanda is green and beautiful. This is the Gisakura Tea Estate in the southwest. This is a colobus monkey. They're one of the only primates that only have four fingers. They don't have a thumb. They spend a lot of time eating the vegetation. This is a potus monkey. As you can see, grooming is a very important part of the life of a primate. This is Lake Kivu, the 20th largest lake in Africa and also the sixth deepest lake in the world. It goes down about 1,500 feet. But it's really beautiful and really blue. The lake is also shared by the Democratic Republic of the Congo, and you can take these beautiful boat rides. In Nyungwe National Park, I have been talking about in southwest Rwanda, it's an ancient forest. It, the biodiversity here is just really tremendous. It's the largest montane rainforest at 247,000 acres. What, one thing that Rwanda does that I really love is the fact that they really include the people in the community as part of the tourist value chain. Tourism is essential in order to preserve, preserve areas, and the government gives back a percentage of fees from tourism back to the community. It's a Rwanda development board that does great work with protecting the wildlife as well as the community. This is a 600 foot long bridge. It's about 250 feet high. It was built by some Brazilian architects with the help of USAID. And also many people believe that Rwanda or Inyungwe is the source of the farthest, most remote source of the Nile.
this is a very young male chimpanzee, and he's in a fig tree. I took this in, in Yungwe because there's a very healthy population of chimpanzees in this forest. And he is demonstrating a mode of locomotion called brachiation. It's the ability to, the, to swing through the trees because they have very flexible shoulders. They have opposable thumbs and opposable toes. Lucy, Australopithecus afarensis, also had shoulders similar to chimpanzees. The um, shoulder blades pointed up, so she was still able to be up in the trees, but she had flat feet because she was bipedal, and that's how we eventually evolved away from the trees and on land, and here we are in Salesforce with iPhones and great technology. I encountered this hippo. I used my zoom lens. I wasn't close, but I am so amazed by these animals. They are the third largest mammal. A male can get up to about 8,000 pounds, or a really big male, and about 11 feet long. They are very related to the cetaceans, the dolphins and the whales. There's quite a lot of them right here. This is also the zebra. You're going to find quite a lot of zebra in Akagera National Park, which is one of the other national parks which is located in Tanzania, uh, right at the border of Tanzania. And also you're going to find the um, impala. These guys are really remarkable. They can jump up about 10 feet. And the fastest antelope. They can run up to about 50 miles per hour. They are called, called the topi. Akagera National Park just brought in a few lions, a couple males and some females, because lions have been extinct from Rwanda for very many years. And they brought them in, and they're really acclimating very well to the park. And I'm sure the Topi aren't happy about it. They have to run from these lions. Now we're going to go to the Pearl of Africa, Uganda. It's right here in the elevated basin between the eastern and western branches of the Great Rift Valley. Winston Churchill called Uganda the Pearl of Africa because he was just so amazed by the beauty. Uganda is the source of the Albertine Nile. This is Lake Victoria, which is the largest lake in Africa. Jinja is the uh, inlet. This is what they always advertise as, be, as being the true source of the Nile. And then the Albertine Nile travels up north into Murchison Falls National Park, and we're going to see some video of that as well. One of my favorite places in the world is Kidepo National Park. It's right at the border of Sudan. This is a Jackson's heart of beast. And CNN, a couple years ago, rated, rated Kidepo as one of the top safari parks in Africa. You can see there's just the most striking and beautiful sunsets and these sprawling savannas with 360 degree views. There's a whole herd of elephants down here. And this is basically what I see when I wake up in the morning. The um, Uganda Wildlife Authority also does a really good job working directly with the communities. And as Suzanne mentioned, working with the people in the communities, you really have to establish conservation strategies that include the people and as we talked about Dr. Kanari Webb's work, their health has to be taken care of. It's very essential. Conservation does not happen in a bubble, and Uganda does a remarkable job of that. Also, we have the giraffes here. There's a lot of giraffes and zebras in Kadepo. And unfortunately, I'm going to show you guys a lot of numbers. 1985, 165,000 giraffes. 2017, there's 97,600. They have dropped by 40% just within the last 30 years, and that has to do with habitat destruction. They're also still hunted. Unfortunately, I see on Facebook a lot of people posing with giraffes that they've killed. Giraffes are a fascinating animal. They are the tallest animal, land animal in the world. They can get up to about 20 feet tall. Giraffes have a 25-pound heart because they need all that gigantic heart to pump all that blood all the way up to their head. They also have a very intricate series of elastic veins and valves so that when they bend down, the valves will close so they don't have a brain hemorrhage. And then when they lift their head up, the valves open. This is the first lion that I encountered in Kidepo. This is the male who is with the female that I had shown you previously. He was very protective of his mate. And he was looking at me, peering at, through the grasses quite aggressively. I took the photos very quickly, and then I left because I didn't want to disturb them. 
lions, unfortunately, their population has plummeted. As you can see, in 1965, there were 450,000 lions, and in 2017, there's probably about 20,000. Again, habitat destruction, the, the loss of their prey. Also, lions are hunted quite a lot, and there's a lot of game hunters from other countries, including the US, that want to go shoot lions. This is a Cape buffalo. These are also one of my favorite animals. They have this big solid bone here. They call that a boss. And they're very formidable. They can reach up to about 1,100, 1,200 pounds. Some parts of their hide is about two inches thick. And you can see in Kadepo, there are literally thousands of them. They cross right in front of our safari vehicle. They're quite intimidating. You don't get out of your vehicle when you're in these national parks. These are very dangerous animals. Lions do hunt them, but sometimes it takes three females to hunt even the smaller females. So they're very dangerous, and their horns can really pierce, them very, pierce the, the um, skin of the lions very easily. This is Murchison Falls National Park. There's 949,000 acres. It's the oldest national park in Uganda. There's 76 mammals, a plethora of bird species. And this is the Albertine Nile that I was telling you about. The Nile here travels at about 11,000 cubic feet per second. It's really powerful. Some people like to raft here. I don't think they raft right here. But the pressure of this water, it flows through this 27 feet foot wide chasm here. This is only 27 feet and it just explodes, it goes down into Lake Albert. The waterfall is about 140 feet down and then into Lake Albert and then, as I mentioned, all the way up to meet the Ethiopian Nile in Sudan. We also have Queen Elizabeth Park. This is the Ugandan Kobe. They are the national symbol of Uganda. And as you can see, the population of elephants has dropped also dramatically, from 1.3 million in 1980 to right about 470,000 now. This is the Kazinga Channel. It's just the most epic experience to be able to photograph and take film of these remarkable people. This is Nepa National Park. This elephant charged me, actually, because he wasn't happy about me taking photos of them. You have to be very careful with the wildlife. They are living in herds, in families. They are a matriarchal society. They have very close bonds with each other. You're going to see some youngsters here. When they're born, they're about 200 pounds. They have the longest gestation period of any land mammal in about two years. This is one of the biggest bull elephants in the red sea. I truly believe it's a tough step. A lot of people ask, how can we stop the poaching? What's very difficult is that unless the demand stops from affluent Asian countries, you're not going to stop poaching. 35,000 elephants literally are killed every single year. That's about 100 killed a day. There is an organization here. I talk about them all the time. They're called Wild Aid. Go to wildaid.org, and they do a great job in terms of educating Asian societies and countries about the importance of not poaching the elephants for the ivory. I love the Nile crocodile. You're going to see a lot of them here. One of the great things about the Ugandan Wildlife Authority is that these are man-eaters. They do kill a lot of people every year. But instead of killing the crocodiles, the Ugandan Wildlife Authority, they risk their lives and they actually capture these crocodiles and relocate them. I have a lot of respect for the work that, I, what that they do. These are such powerful animals. They're 650 million years old. They haven't changed at all. There are 600 species of birds just here at uh, Queen Elizabeth, and this is the um, sea eagle, or the fishing eagle. The strangest looking bird. This is the shoebill. They're about five feet tall. They weigh about 12 pounds. They can fly. They use really slow wing beats, but they eat a lot of fish, and this is one of the birds that's rehabbed at the Wildlife Education Center. I would like to also talk about the work of my friend, wildlife vet, Dr. Gladys Kalemazikusilka. 
she's the founder of Conservation Through Public Health. The work that she does is very similar to Kenari's work. I'm going to be filming a documentary on Dr. Gladys's work and also Kenari's work in Borneo. Here, Dr. Gladys is with the um, coffee collective, the farmers here in Bawindi. They grow fantastic coffee. Conservation Through Public Health is a three-tiered program, wildlife conservation, community health, and income generating projects. It's very important as we talk about, and as Suzanne mentioned, we have to have community-led conservation. We need an integrated approach where the community is their partners in our conservation efforts. And the only way you're going to achieve that is to make sure that their health is taken care of and also that they have good livelihoods. Dr. Gladys just launched a venture called GorillaConservationCoffee.org. You can visit the website. This is in partnership with the World Wildlife Fund in Switzerland. And the whole concept, again, is if the farmers are able to make a good livelihood by producing excellent coffee and bringing it to market, then that's going to lessen their need to go into the forests of Bawindi and, and log and, or poach gorillas. Because a lot of times, in order to pay for just basic health care, they need to go into to the forest and illegally cut timber. Dr. Gladys does really remarkable work in the Windy. The Windy National Forest, impenetrable forest, is where half of the world's mountain gorillas are found. There's 880 of them, 400 in Bawindi, and then the rest are in Rwanda, Volcanoes National Park, and then in Virunga National Park. You can see them, gorillas, they're, they're large animals. They can get up to about 400 pounds for a male. They are a male-dominated society. They live in troops. Conservation through hub, uh, public health, but they have a holistic approach to biodiversity conservation, and they integrate the human services as well as community development, like the coffee that we were talking about. And it's, their mission really is to enable people and wildlife and livestock to coexist together. This is Dr. Gladys. She does a lot of out, outreach programs teaching about family planning. Family planning is really essential because if you have a population that's growing exponentially, there's so much competition for resources, and that's when you start having a lot of problems being able to conserve animals and conserve the forest. The Batwa, Bakiga, and Bufobira are the indigenous people that Dr. Gladys assists, and she has a lot of um, village health workers that go in there to make sure the, um, the people are doing okay with their health. They do a lot of work with hygiene and sanitation, which is essential for a healthy community. The savings and loan has been established. The community, including the men, are part of the family planning. And also there's been a real increase in proper hygiene. And as you can see, this all assists in conservation because the people are part of the process. They are also part of the tourist value chain. And they have a better attitude about the gorillas and conservation on a whole. And this really, really helps in preventing a lot of the conflicts between humans and gorillas. My friend Abias took, took this photo here, a very young gorilla. We share 98% of our genetic makeup with the gorillas. About 15, 16 years ago, Dr. Gladys was working as a wildlife vet in Bawindi, and there was an outbreak of scabies, which is the mite that, that uh, attacks your skin. And the gorillas ended up getting the scabies from the community, and one of the youngsters died. And that's where she realized that in order to help the gorillas she would also have to help the people because we can pass all the same diseases that we have onto the gorillas and vice versa. Now we are going to visit Ngama Island Chimpanzee Sanctuary and here I am with some of the staff when I lived on the island for a month as well as one of the vets. The Chimpanzee Sanctuary and Wildlife Conservation Trust is responsible for all the aspects of the sanctuary. We have 95 acres of pristine forest habitat for our chimpanzees, and we're located on Lake Victoria. The remaining five acres are for the guests and people that visit, the vet clinic, as well as the food preparation area is there. This is a little FaceTime with the girls. As I mentioned, when we first uh, met, we have 46 chimpanzees that have all been rescued from the illegal wildlife trade. We are part of the Kumi group of islands, and the Chimpanzee Trust does a lot of community development with the islands because they also suffer from a lot of poverty. These are my friends and they're assisting with beekeeping. There's also sanitation, clean water projects, 
and alternative livelihoods are strongly supported by the chimpanzee tribe. This is my friend Silver Bilunji. He's an education officer. He does a fantastic job going into the schools and teaching kids about wildlife because he truly believes that they are the um, agents of change. They are the ambassadors that will continue on with the conservation work that we're involved in. Ngama Island was founded by Dr. Jane Goodall in 1998, along with a group of founding trustees. Our mission is to promote the understanding, appreciation, and conservation of chimpanzees and their habitat. This is our executive director to the left, Lily Ajarova, and here she is with Dr. Goodall. A few facts about the chimpanzees. We share 98.7% of our DNA with them. They are our closest living relatives. We are also primates and of the family hominidae. We shared a common ancestor and diverged from the primates, from the chimpanzees, about five to seven million years ago. Chimps are not monkeys, and one of the main reasons they are great apes is that they don't have tails. Monkeys have tails. Monkeys are, don't tend to be quite as intelligent as the great apes. And one of the big differences, the great apes, the um, youngsters, are very dependent on their mom for a long period of time. They, a male is dependent on his mom until he's around 11 or 12 years of age. With the monkeys, they tend to grow up a lot faster. Chimpanzees are an endangered species. About 100 years ago, there was one to two million. And now they estimate there's probably 300,000, maybe, maybe less. But they are found specifically in the west to east belt of equatorial Africa. Unfortunately, these are the conditions that a lot of the chimpanzees are found in when they are rescued from the illegal wildlife trade by the Ugandan Wildlife Authority. They're kept in really filthy cages. The biggest market is China, the Middle East, and Russia, and this is for disreputable zoos, private collections. Bushmeat is a really big threat for the chimpanzees. The bushmeat trade and also the pet trade works hand in hand. The hunters go into the forest and they drive the um, chimpanzees up trees with dogs and then they shoot the moms, take the babies from the moms and then sell them on the bushmeat trade. And it's really horrific for the babies because chimpanzees are just like, like humans. They're very attached to their mom, they're very dependent. And a lot of these chimps, they end up very traumatized. But instead of being stuck in a laboratory or being forced to perform tricks at a zoo or dead, our chimpanzees live on the 46, uh, on the 95 acres. This is Sarah. She's eating her favorite fruit, jackfruit. You can see they're excellent climbers. It does cost about $135 a month to feed the chimpanzees, and we take a lot of donations as well as adoption. We process that, you know, go online to adopt, adopt one of these chimps. This is Pasa, she's 16 years old, and Athena is taking a stick. They don't always like to share their food. Chimpanzees live in a male-dominated society. As you can see, grooming is a very important part of their culture. They groom in order to reinforce bonds. Being very physical and playful is important. Sarah here is only seven years of age. And these are some of the females that are entering the court. They live in a fission fusion society. The eight caregivers have a very close relationship. And when I was living on the island during that month's time, I was really inspirited by how close they are to these chimps. It's, they're like members of their own family. They have a great vet clinic with two vets. The chimpanzees get checked every single year. This is Dr. Rakunda who's coming in, and Sarah is getting very sleepy because she is under anesthesia, but she trusts her caregivers very much. And it's great to see the, the strong bond that they have. There's very little limited, there's very little contact between the chimpanzees and the caregivers. But during the veterinary procedures, there is a lot of trust so that they can work with them very closely. All the females are on birth control because we don't want to breed chimpanzees. There's limited space and resources, but accidents happen. There's about a 4% failure rate for the birth control. And this little guy, I met him when he was four days of age. When his mom gave birth, 
some of the other females tried to take him away from her, and that's why he's fractured his arm. But Dr. Rukundo put the um, arm in a um, cast, and he's doing very well now. He was raised by a female, um, female caregiver, human caregiver, and there he is, very healthy, very happy. He's going to be gradually integrated into the group. It does take some time for that integration process, especially because he's a male, and the caregivers take a lot of time, gradually bring him into the enclosure with the chimpanzees and then out into the forest. This is Kalema. He was rescued by my friend, the wildlife vet, Dr. Gladys Kalema, and he is a dominant male here. As I mentioned, they live in a fission fusion society, which means they come together in smaller groups, or they'll come together in a large group for breeding, also for grooming, hunting. Chimpanzees do hunt, especially the males. And then what they do is they separate into smaller subgroups. Chimpanzees, the communities can be anywhere between 20 to 100. Chimpanzee communities do not get along. These are very aggressive animals, and when a community encounters another community in the wild, they will fight very seriously and sometimes kill each other. Kalema is a contender for the dominant male position, but he has one big issue. All he likes to do is eat. He continues to eat and stuff his face, and he doesn't pay attention to all the social interactions that go on around him. And if you're a dominant chimpanzee, if there's other chimpanzees that are fighting, you have to go in there and you have to break it up. You have to show them that you're the alpha male. But he'd rather just hang out with the girls and eat. Chimpanzees, 85% of their diet is fruit. They eat a lot of leaves as well. Chimpanzees do hunt colobus monkeys. And they have a whole process that they go through when they're hunting where they will strategize and drive the colobus monkeys up a tree. And then the meat that they get, there's a lot of chimpanzee politics, and the, the male who has his prize will divvy out the meat to females that he likes and males who he likes and others that he doesn't like or is competitive with, they won't get any meat. It's uh, the politics of meat. This is Hoima in western Uganda. This is a very important area because there's a large population of chimpanzees. Uh, Budongo, you had mentioned that you, you had gone to Budongo. This is an important corridor. These are privately owned forests, and the community development and conservation is really inextricably entwined, and that's why there has to be a lot of outreach programs through the Chimpanzee Trust. There's the Kiamalila Wildlife Education Center, and it's really cool. I, I visited there about a year and a half ago, and what they do is they have programs where they use the art and music and dance and drumming as a way to teach people about wildlife, to teach them about chimpanzees and the importance of conserving the forest. They had um, a wildlife conservation festival for the kids about six months ago. They taught them about vegetable growing, tree nursery, nursery sustainable management, and they made it really fun by having arts and crafts, and that's really important. And when I was working at Six Flags with the um, Tigers and Lions, we had a lot of outreach programs teaching kids and I, I really saw the importance at a young age that it's important that we have youth involved with the environment and with nature. This is Henry Biodufu and he is um, the forest manager. As you can see, 61,000 seedlings were distributed to the forest owners in order to reforest their areas and the Chimpanzee Trust works with the sustainable land management so that people know what the value is instead of just cutting down all the forest for cash crops like sugarcane and tobacco. Uh, I was here with a group of scientists and they really involved the community by having them part of the data collection process. This is a Itoyo forest. They have camera traps there and the community leaders are involved with checking the camera tracks, viewing the footage also. You can tell the status of the chimpanzees by looking for their poop, counting poop, and also looking up in the trees and seeing how many nests there are. This is a beautiful bamboo forest. There weren't any chimpanzees when I visited, but um, community leaders said that this is one of the favorite places for the chimpanzees to spend time. This really mitigates a lot of the chimpanzee-human conflict when the community has an understanding of these animals, our closest living relatives. I met Lily Tika Masire, who is a forest owner in the Hoima area. 
And I was so inspired by her story. She's a school teacher and she owns this beautiful forest that she took us through. She really wants to preserve her land and also cares about the chimpanzees. And she told me a story that she's planting her crops and one of the chimpanzees will just come and sit there and watch her and he waits for her approval. And when she tells him to go ahead, it's okay, he'll go up a tree, get some fruit, come down, eat half of it, and actually leave half of it for her. It's really cool. It's a remarkable experience to meet the Ugandans who really care about their environment and respect the animals. Chimpanzees are a flagship species, and that means that when we protect them, we also protect other animals and wildlife within their biodiversity. I truly believe that the future of wildlife is in our hands and is, is in our control in many respects. And I encourage all of you to become involved in wildlife conservation projects. Contact Suzanne, contact also Kinari and my project as well. You can reach me at chris at chrisaustria.com. And I'm on Facebook and Twitter at Chris Austria. Definitely reach out to me. I'd love to talk to all of you. And, get to know you. This is another photo of Tumbo being playful. I'm on Instagram at Christopher Austria and my website is chrisaustriaphotography.com. And I'm going to go through these slides as we do a question and answer. Feel free to ask any questions that you might have for me or Suzanne or Kinari. Any questions online? So, in general, um, what kind of people or organizations own all these private game reserves and these um, private forests? Are they when? What's the purpose of these, these private privatized lands? The um, privatized lands they're owned by forest owners, and it's for people's livelihoods, they grow their crops there. And one of the other forests that I went to, he really tries to manage it as much as he can, and he's able to use everything from the forest in order to sustain himself. But there also has to be a lot of regulation and a lot of, as we keep mentioning, work with the communities. And the national parks are governed by the Ugandan Wildlife Authority, the Rwanda Development Board, the Ugandan Wildlife Authority. So are you saying these privatized lands are just like, they're not necessarily conservationists that are owning the property, they're used for all sorts of purposes? Yes, they're used for all sorts of purposes. And many of them are conservationists, but some of them aren't. And there always is um, the struggle between the needs of the people and conservation. And recently, there, there were struggles over land title because uh, a portion of the government they were giving title to a sugar cane company and they ended up cutting down some trees and then they finally stopped it. But again, it's always that struggle between privately owned lands, national parks. There's national parks where people will go into to post sometimes or also to find resources. Um, hi, uh, thank you for speaking. You're welcome. Um, besides donating directly to some of the organizations you mentioned, what can people do in terms of products we should or shouldn't buy or labels we should look out for when purchasing products? Palm oil. Right, Kinari? Can, 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 you, can you speak a little bit about that from your perspective and also about timber that we shouldn't buy since you're, you're in Borneo? Thanks. It's nice to see you all. Um, we're really, really excited that Chris might be able to come out and do a film about us. So it's wonderful. Thank you. I'm honored. He's, he's doing amazing work. I mean, for me, it seems like we are at a critical point on this planet, right? We need to remember that like all these amazing creatures that we're seeing and in Borneo too, we're losing them at an incredible rate. Chris showed a lot of that data. Um, and in Borneo also, it's, it's very serious. We've had the fastest rate of deforestation the world has ever known there. Um, and a lot of that is palm oil, not all of it. Many of it is actually local communities. And like in Africa, people 
are forced to destroy their long-term well-being in order to meet their short-term well-being. So that's like they need to get um, health care, right? And of course, any of us would do anything to save our child's life. So that, so donating to organizations is very helpful, but um, but also, yeah, donate palm oil. That's probably the critical thing. There's lots. It's a really complicated answer to that question. Yes, there are some companies that are doing a much better job, and I believe that we should support that direction. However, most of them what's called sustainable is not actually all that sustainable. And it's not a very healthy oil, too. If you can avoid it, it's probably better. Yeah. Um, and, and timber is a complicated one. Malaysia exports about 150% of the legal timber that it cuts. 50% extra is coming mostly from uh, Indonesian National Park. So that's a complicated thing. And But on the other hand, forests are more valuable if the wood is really valued. And sustainable forestry can happen. And that might, that's certainly, sustainable forestry is certainly better than palm oil. So I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm not exactly sure which is the way to go on that one. Thank you, Knarr. We've got some questions online as well. Um, let me grab that. So Carla has a question. With the Ebola scare, Africa saw a big drop off of tourism across the continent, which affected conservation efforts because they rely heavily on tourist dollars. How are things faring now that the Ebola epidemic seems to be in check? Very good question. I was, it really amazed me how when the Ebola outbreak came out, it happened in the very specific countries in West Africa, and everyone thought that it was all Africa, because many people still view Africa as, as a country, not a continent, and it had a severe effect on tourism. And as we mentioned, tourism is essential, responsible tourism is essential in order to conserve these beautiful animals. It's really, it really has bounced back. I thought it would take a lot longer, but tourism has actually really picked up. But anytime anything happens in Africa, the, the um, shooting and the, and the mall attack in Kenya, for some reason everyone was scared to go to any parts of, of Africa after that. And it's really unfortunate. We don't, I, I'm astounded how we don't get a lot of positive views of Africa. And it's, I really feel that my responsibility really is to teach people about the beauty of this continent and to spread knowledge instead of, um, and to break the misconceptions that a lot of people have. But as far as um, Ebola, it, the tourism has definitely bounced back, and no one even talks about it anymore. Another question. We have the flagship animals such as the chimpanzees, the, um, the great apes, the elephants, the lions, all, all the, um, the large animals that people are really impressed by. Because a lot of us are emotionally moved by animals such as elephants, but we don't really think about frogs or, or bats, for example. But as I mentioned, we have these indicator species such as bats and salamanders and frogs that are very sensitive to the environment and they are indicator species, they reflect the condition of the environment and scientists can judge any changes that occur through these indicator species. But those are the animals that get, get lost a lot of the time. But for example, when you protect the um, great apes, there's so many other animals, and not just animals, there's also plant life, there's vegetation, that gets protected as well under the umbrella of protecting the um, elephants and also the, um, the umbrella species is another way that we, we term it. Anything online? Yep, another question on, online from Natasha. Thanks so much for sharing this information. Are any conservation groups that you work with focused on helping the chimpanzees in Liberia that were abandoned by the New York Blood Center? I know a lot of 
organizations that were in, involved with saving those chimpanzees. But I don't know. I'm not in contact with any of them directly. But I definitely applaud the work that they do because that was really terrible. You have animals that are used in laboratories and then they're just cast out to fend for themselves and they're born in captivity. But I, unfortunately, I'm not in contact with any of them. But there are great organizations that are involved with that situation. So I feel like, um, well, it's obvious that we're losing this battle drastically on, on saving these, you know, the environment and the animals, right? It's really obvious, right? So, but I feel like the, you know, you mentioned the problem is poverty, but I think the root of that problem is, I mean, I feel like that root of that problem is more like corruption because it's like countries in Africa and also Indonesia. They're known to be corrupt, corrupt countries, right? I mean, I mean, that's what I feel. I don't know. Maybe is there another? What are your thoughts on that? And is there a way to tackle that problem? It seems like political to me. So it, it is very political, and I, I hear about corruption all the time. There's a lot of corruption in our, in our country, but for some reason, when we hear about Africa, we always hear about corruption. But I have been in these three countries and I see remarkable work that the government themselves are, are doing. And Kinari, I'm sure you could speak on this as well. It does feel hopeless sometimes. But actually, I have experienced that it is win-win solutions are totally possible and they're possible quickly. We talk to, we do what I call radical listing. We talk to all the communities around this really precious national park that has about 10% of the remaining world, orangutans. And they said we need access to healthcare and organic farming training. And with those two, thring, two things, we can completely stop the logging. After just five years, we had a 68% decline in illegal logging rates. And after eight years, we had an 87% decline. So it, this is, it's, it's doable. And yes, are these, are these governments non-functional? Yes, they're non-functional. If we leave the future of the planet, I think, to governments everywhere in the world, we're not going to make it. But we actually need to do radical listening in communities all over the world. What do they need? These are community-determined solutions, not solutions from outside. And then even when it sounds like they don't go together, they do, right? Like organic farming training is critical because the traditional form of the agriculture there was slash and burn. And they identified that that wasn't working anymore, right? And they've shifted, and 52% of those ex-loggers have now shifted to farming, right? So these systems really work. And then we need to match them with the global resources all over the world that are kind of excess. And there are lots of people who want to help. They just don't know what to do. And there's a lot of programs that are trying to help, but not necessarily doing exactly what the communities identify as the need. So I, I actually do have hope. It's you know, which sounds crazy looking at all these numbers, but I think if we do it in the right way, we can find win-win solutions. Thank you, Kinar. And and also, some I, I know the numbers are pretty drastic. What what I show, and I, I do that for a reason because not many people know how bad things are in many respects for endangered species. But one other thing, Uganda does such a great job in protecting their resources and the population of elephants in Uganda, which is about 5,000, has increased over the last 20 years and the population of lions is doing very well. And in fact, the Ugandan Wildlife Authority in, in Kampala, the main city, they just caught a poacher from Ghana who had a ton of, literally a ton of ivory in his apartment. And there are a lot of positive aspects, and in, in even with governments, which can be a problem. And yes, there there are there are issues of corruption, but there's also government agencies that do a fantastic job in conservation as That's well. That's true. Yes. And these are all national parks, right? Too, which is something the governments have done very well. Yes, exactly. Anything else, Christina? We could just give a little clap for our guests. Oh, thank you so thank much, you very much for coming thank in. Thank you, Suzanne Canari.
Chris, Suzanne, uh, Kinari. Um, I know that I want to have more conversations about this, um, and I'll be talking to this crew. So if anybody would like to join, uh, please reach out to me. I sent out this invitation so you can find my email in the invite. Um, but yeah, so happy to have you guys, and thanks for coming. Thank you. Thank you, Salesforce. Thanks for inviting thank us. Thank you, Tina. Roland, thank you very much. And Christina, can we